this whole thing starting out at 4.30. Should we, should we start? Right. Are you ready? Ready? <laughs> Are we ready? <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. So today, um, it's our pleasure to have Evan with us to give a talk on Elder's Post. Right? Yes. Please. So can I start? So hello everyone, uh, thanks to everyone for being here and maybe for some people that are online, thanks for, thanks for watching. Um, so I'm Evangelos Ordopas, I'm a PhD student working with Christophe Paul and Dimitris Silikos in uh, Montpellier, in Lyre, in France. And uh, first I would like to thank Sebastian and St. Gilles for uh, making this happen, allow me to visit here and also give me the opportunity to give the, the talk at the seminar. So I'm going to be presenting some joint work with uh, my supervisors and Sebastian, which is part of the group here. And this will be on uh, Erdosposa dualities for minors, as my title says. So maybe some people are familiar with the concept of uh, the Erdosposa property in this room. So. For those that are, I will be giving a somehow unorthodox formulation of the problems, but uh, bear with me, I hope you, it will become apparent why I do it like that. So I will just start. So I'm going to give some very basic notions about minors. So we say that uh, so the minor relation is just a way to, to compare graphs. So I say that the graph H is a minor of a graph Z if it can be obtained by a subgraph. I mean, I can just remove vertices and edges from my big graph. For example, I can cross out this, this crossed out vertex there, I just remove it. And then I can also contract edges. So you can imagine this just as taking uh, connected blobs of my big graph and contracting this into one vertex. So I can obtain from this graph on the right, the graph on the left, which is a minor bit. <coughs> and um, I want to define also what it means to define a minor closed graph class. So I take a set of graphs, and if for every graph in my class I put in my set all of its minors, I define a, a minor closed graph class. So it's a set that respects the, the minor relation. And uh, for such a class, which is minor closed, I can define a notion of abstraction to it in terms of excluding some set of graphs. And this is defined as the taking the minimal graphs with respect to the minor relation that are not in my class. So this I will define with this obs of G for the rest of my talk. So a very classic result from the 30s by Kradovsky and then later Wagner is essentially a nice uh, combinatorial characterization of planarity, of the minor closed property of being planar. What does it mean for a graph to be planar? It means that there exists a plane embedding of it in two dimensions. So these two graphs that I have here are planar graphs and they are drawn in a plane way. It means that there are no two edges that are crossing. Uh, so instead of this topological definition, I can equivalently define planarity via excluding these two graphs here. And this is the abstraction set of planar graphs. The complete graph on five vertices K5 and the complete bipartite graph with three vertices in each side. So a natural question that somebody can ask is, OK, I do this for uh, planarity, but can I do this more generally for more minor closed properties? And the answer is positive. And this is a product of a very big result by Robertson and Seymour in 2004, where they essentially what they prove is that if I take the set of all graphs, which I denote by G all, uh, with ordered by the minor relation, this is what we call a well quasi ordering. So I'm going to give an exact definition of this. but. What is important to understand is that being a well-quasi ordering implies that I cannot have infinite anti-chains in my partial order. So, and because of the minimality of the way I define the abstraction set, this is always an anti-chain of graphs. So this implies that for every minor closed property, this, uh, the, the abstraction set is finite. So I have a finite characterization for any such property. OK, so somewhat gives me a graph class, a minor closed graph class. I want to define a notion of how close I am, uh, how close a given graph is to belonging in this class. And I will define this in the most simple way that I can think of. And I will define the notion of an H modulator. So what is an H modulator? It is just a set of vertices that if I remove from a graph, 
I fall into my target class H. And at the same time, I want to define somehow a dual notion to this. I want to define a notion that somehow obstructs me. It's a, it's a way to explain why I have large H modulators, why I cannot with a few number of vertices fall into my target class. And the way I do it is by defining this notion of an H barrier. So I could define this more generally, but in this context of minors, I will define a barrier as a set of disjoint subgraphs of my graph G, such that each of these subgraphs contains some obstruction, a reason why I'm not in the class. And then on these two objects, I will define two graph parameters. So the apex number to my target class H, I will define as the minimum size of the modulator, of an H modulator, meaning what is the smallest number of vertices I can remove so that I fall into my target class. And then the barrier number, uh, number with respect to H, I will define it as the maximum size of an H barrier. What is the biggest size of an obstacle to, to being in H? Is there any reason you could exist at your quantification before universal in the definition of barrier? Um, actually, okay, good point. This is wrong. It should be the opposite. So for every, for every, uh, for every guy in my set ah. B, I want that there is some <laughs> abstraction that it contains. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't see it. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. So, um, so the. The very easy observation that we could make here is that if I have a graph G that contains an H barrier of size K, then I need, so every H modulator towards my class H has size, needs to have size at least K. I need to hit at least one of these, one vertex from each of these, these good disjoint guys to kill all occurrences of an obstruction in my input graph. So this gives me one trivial direction of how these two parameters correlate. So the apex number always upper bounds the barrier number for a given class H. So the a question that somebody could ask is when and why might the opposite to inequality also hold? Maybe not exactly, but maybe asymptotically. Is there, a, is there, are there cases where we can bound the behavior of these parameters? Do they behave in the same way? So to formulate this uh, question, I will define uh, something that I will call an Erdos-Posa pair. So I'm given a class H and a class G, which are minor closed. I define an Erdos-Posa pair, HG, in the following way. I say I want that there exists some function that does exactly what we said before, bounds the parameter in the opposite direction. So not exactly, but asymptotically. So whenever this is the case, I will say that H and G is an Erdos-Posa pair. And I will call from now on H my target class, which I've already done. And I will call G my environment class, from the class from which I select my input graphs. So the seminal result in this, in this area that also gives na the name to this, uh, to this definition is a theorem by Erdos and Poza in 65, which in this weird formulation of the problem, essentially says that if I look at, if my, my, my target class is the set of all acyclic graphs, this paired with the set of all graphs is an erdos posa pair and uh, with an explicit gamma function, which is of uh, order k log k. So if somebody's familiar with the erdos posa property, the way to see this in the standard formulation would be to first observe that the only obstruction with respect to minors to being acyclic is containing uh, the, sm the smallest possible cycle, K3, some cycle. And the standard formulation of the problem would be to say that either I can find many disjoint copies of cycles in my graph, at K of them, or there exists some small set of vertices, F of K, that if I remove it, I kill all such cycles. So my graph becomes acyclic. Okay, so. This is like the, fir the very first result. So um, another result, which is uh, like well, another result, which yeah, sorry. So yes, the, the, the question now is, can we prove more stuff? So what, which pairs are Erdos Posa pairs? And the result I want to talk about is a very famous result by Robin Seymour in the context of minors, which is the first type of duality I'm going to be giving here, which uh, essentially says that if uh, my target class, so 
for HTO to be under the spot pair, my, my target class has to exclude a planar graph. And this is an if and only if. So the distinguishing property for having an Erdos-Posa pair, so the distinguishing property for <laughs> HG being an Erdos-Posa pair where G is any minor closed class, has to, my target cl class has to exclude a planar graph. And over the next few slides, I will try to give you a, an idea of how to prove this result. But first in this slide, I'm going to be talking about some concepts that are needed in order to prove, and I will do it again in a kind of an orthodox way because I'm also trying to somehow do some small pro propaganda of the way we like to see things, <laughs> the parametric viewpoint. So what are the necessary things in order to prove this theorem? So there is a structural parameter at play here, which is <coughs> three width, which I will define formally in the next slide. And then there is uh, this set that contains this thing gamma, which gamma is what we like to call a parametric graph. So it's not longer a single graph, but uh, I call a parametric graph a sequence of graphs that, that is monotone with respect to the minor relation. So you can think of it as a, you can think of this graph as having some nice regular way of defining it, but then as the index there grows, only the size of, of, of this graph grows somehow. So the parametric graph gamma that I, define, that I want to define here is the sequence of grids. So this is the sixth instance of the sequence, which is just a six by six grid. And the, the important result, the, 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 the core argument that is needed in order to prove this duality is uh, that the sequence of grids is what we like to call a universal abstraction for tree width. And what does it mean to be a universal abstraction? Essentially, it means that that tree width is equivalent to a parameter that I define on this sequence, where the parameter is simply defined as what is the maximum order of uh, grid I can find in my graph as a minor. So the asymptotic equivalence that I mentioned here, that these two squiggly lines there, essentially means that there exists some function that I can bound the behavior of the two parameters in both directions. So the two parameters are not the same, but they behave in the same way asymptotically, meaning that if my tree width is large, I have the, there is some large grid as a minor in my graph, and vice versa. If I contain a large grid, I have large tree width. So the second important observation in order to prove this is that this parametric graph is also captures a nice, ca captures this topological property of being planar. So this is another alternative way to see planar graphs in terms of being a minor of, so of one of these uh, parametric graphs as I define them. So what do I mean by, in the slide here, that I captures planarity? Essentially, I mean that for any fixed planar graph H, there exists some constant, some number that depends only on this planar graph such that the graph is a minor of a now big enough grid. So essentially, you don't have to think of planar graphs as in the topological way of defining them, but I ca we can also see them as being minors of grids and nothing more. So a third and last observation that is required is that the grid itself contains integral copies of itself. So a large enough grid contains many disjoint copies of a grid inside of it. And here in gamma 6, we can see that it contains four copies of gamma 3, of some smaller instance inside it. So how do we combine all of these uh, like random things I have defined, I have shown you here on this slide, to prove this result? So the first thing we would, we would like to prove is that if I bound my environment class to be the, the, the class of bounded tree with graphs, bounded by T, then uh, no matter which guest, guest class I select H, then this is an Erdos Posa pair. And this is another result by Robinson Seymour. So forgive me for this, but now I have to give this wall of, this wall of <laughs> definition to introduce tree width, and I have to do it in the standard way through 3D compositions, because this is what I will use in my proof sketch. So what is a 3D composition of a graph? It is a pair t, comma beta, where t is just some tree, and beta is a function that maps to each node of my tree some subset of vertices <coughs> of my graph. And I want this to this 3D composition to satisfy three properties. The first being that if I take the union of all of these bugs, as we call them, 
This is the full ver vertex of my graph. I have not forgotten anything. The second condition says that if I look at any edge of my graph, I should find this in the bag of some node of my tree. And the third and most important one says that if I look at any vertex of my graph and I look at the bugs, I look at the nodes whose bugs contain this vertex, then this should induce something connected. It should form a subtree of my tree. So this is the definition of a tree decomposition. And I want to turn this into a width parameter. So the way I will do it is by defining the width of my decomposition to be the maximum size of a bug minus one. And then eventually I define tree width as the minimum over all of these, three, these uh, three, the widths of the tree decompositions. Okay, so how do I prove this, uh, this theorem? Well, the, the way I will do it is by induction over k. And the k here is the size of the edge barrier we're trying to find. So I will give you an inductive proof that either finds a k barrier of, an edge barrier of size k, or it finds a small module, H modulator in the inside of, of size f of k, where I define uh, f this uh, recursive function, which I hope it is correct for uh, what I'm trying to do. So how do I prove this? I just take a uh, decomposition of bounded width, bounded by t. And then I, for each edge, for, for some uh, edge of my, uh, of my tree here, I define these two parts as the, the union of the bugs in each part to define these two subgraphs. And I also look at the uh, intersection between these two neighboring bugs. And what we have to observe here is that this intersection, because of the third property of the, of the third decomposition, the separating property, essentially says that this uh, bug is a, we, we can prove that this bug is a separator in my graph. So there is no way to go from the orange part to the blue part without crossing through the pink. So then the first thing I could ask is, is this intersection of some arbitrary edge, is it an edge modulator? If this is the case, I trivially conclude. So I remove this uh, small set and I find my modulator. So now there are two cases left to check. If this does not happen, then I know that either both sides, the orange side and the blue side, contain uh, some obstruction, a minor of an obstruction. So then I can, I can just apply my induction for uh, apply my induction for k minus one and conclude. Or for every edge, there should be one specific side of the two that contains a minor of an obstruction. So this allows me to orient the edges of my decomposition in one specific direction. And by doing this, uh, we can observe that there has to be eventually a sink in my decomposition, a node where every guy point, points towards. And then I simplify my modulator by removing <coughs> this uh, bug, because it's of small size. So if we set up the numbers correctly, this should go through. So this is pretty much the idea of how to deal with the case of bounded tree width. So, don't you, I mean, so you have a bag, one bag, where everything points towards? Yes. That bag has size and most t plus 1. It has, yes, size at most t here. Yeah, at most t plus one. Yeah, the three with this t. K is the size of the of the barrier I'm trying to find. Right. So I, I was wondering whether you have you need a t plus one in the recursion, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, may, may, <laughs> maybe the function is not perfectly okay. <laughs> I, I, it should be. I'm not sure. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Maybe there is a plus one and minus yeah. one there missing or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what do we do in the case of unbounded tree width? So the the core result that allows us to prove the universal abstraction result that I mentioned earlier about tree width is the the grid theorem from Robertson and Seymour. Again, which says that there exists some function such that if my tree width is larger than this function, then I contain a large grid as a minor. And uh, co this theorem combined with the previous observation that I mentioned, that for every planar graph, there is some number such that, so that this planar graph is a minor of a uh, large enough grid. I can, sh I can show the following, that if my graph contains an appropriately large grid as a minor, I can use 
the, the property that the grid packs itself integrally to find many copies of my planar graph in my large enough grid. So if I'm working with a class that excludes some planar graph, so it contains a planar graph as a minor, I can find a large edge barrier like this. So then the barrier number with respect to this class is large, and this proves the one direction of the duality that I want. So if I have bounded tree width, I apply this inductive proof. If, I, if my tree width is unbounded, I am able to find always a large edge barrier of one planar abstraction from my class. Okay, so what about the negative result? How do I prove the, the other direction? Well, now we have to go away from, from planar graphs and we have to inevitably enter the world of uh, embeddability in a surface of larger genus. So I assume now that I have a class such that does not contain any planar abstraction. Everything that excludes is non-planar. So I will pick a surface of as small Euler genus as I can, such that at least one of my <coughs> abstractions can embed in the surface. For simplicity, let's assume that the, the, the class I'm looking at exclu excludes only K5, so it's the, the K5 minor free graphs. So what is, this what is one of the two minimal surfaces with this property? The orientable surface with, the, with this property is the, the torus, where K5 can embed. So you can imagine a torus as a, as a donut in three dimensions. So let's try to see how I can draw a K5 in the, the torus. So one way to do it is like that. So let's try to draw a second copy of a K5. So I will, I will slide, I will twist a bit my drawing of this, a, a little bit to the right and up, and I can draw a second copy in this fashion. What we can observe is that because of the minimality of the way I select my surface, because of the minimality with respect to the oral genus, there is no way to embed a second K5 that does not inter intersect the first. There is no way I can find two disjoint copies in there. But what I can do, and I can continue, I can keep on doing this by shifting a little bit my drawing, I can, I can, I can embed as many copies of K5 as I like, with the following two properties. So as I said, there are no two disjoint copies, but I can do it in a way such that every vertex belongs, every white vertex which I introduce uh, at each intersection point is only used in at most two of my copies. So in this way I define, I take the union of all of these K5s and I define this ZHK graph. So this is the instance ZH3. So what we can observe is that the barrier number uh, of this graph for every k is always one because there are no two disjoint copies while the apex number is arbitrarily arbitrarily big because still because of the second property that every vertex belongs in at most two copies I still need to hit at least k over two many vertices to eliminate all copies of a k5 in my graph so this gives us our first negative result there is no function that bounds the behavior of these two parameters so, and the negative result is that if my guest class only excludes non-planar graphs, then these two pairs are not Erdos-Posa pairs. And these two, these two symbols I use here, the left one essentially is the, the set of all minors of my minimal uh, orientable surface. Here is just the, the graphs embeddable in a torus. And the notation I have on the right with the N as the superscript is the set of uh, all minors of the my non-orientable minimal uh, surface. In this case, for K5, it would be the projective plane. Okay, so now we actually get the if and only if. So if my graph excludes, uh, if my class excludes a planar graph, I know what to do. And at the same time, if it does not exclude the planar graph, I cannot expect my environment class to contain the set of all graphs because already for these two pairs, I obtain a negative result. Okay, so we cannot expect to do this for uh, Erdos-Posa pairs and the definition of a barrier we have, but what about trying to relax a little bit this definition? 
So, guided by the previous counterexample, the way I'm going to relax my definition is, okay, I can no longer ask for these joint copies, but I can ask that every vertex belongs in at most two members of my uh, barrier. So in this way, I define the notion of a half integral barrier. And in the same way as before, I can define the half integral barrier number as the maximum size of a half integral barrier. The trivial observation still holds. The apex number bounds the half integral barrier number. And uh, in the same way, I define what it means to be a half integral Erdos-Posa pair, where I just replace barrier number by half integral barrier number. So there was this uh, conjecture by Thomas that every pair is a half integral Erdos-Posa pair. And this uh, conjecture was verified a couple of years ago by you in a, like a very big, very difficult to paper to understand, where he essentially proves that for Every H, H G O is a half integral Erdos Posa pair. So half integrality works everywhere. So every pair is a half integral Erdos Posa pair. However, the proof of this uh, theorem is uh, non constructive. There is no esti estimation of the gap function. So there is, no way to, uh, there is no way to actually compute the, the an half integral H barrier or an H modulator out of uh, the proof of U. <coughs> Okay, so we know what happens. We know what is the limit for integrality. We have to exclude the planar graph. And we know that half integrality works all the time. But there, there are like an infinite number of dualities in between that we could ask the same question for. So the, the very first question is, can we obtain such dualities further excluding planar graphs? What is the condition of, on, on the environment class? What, how do we have to restrict? What should, what should be the correct condition? So the first thing to observe, which I already made this remark, is that if Hg prime is an Erdos-Posa pair, then Hg is also an Erdos-Posa pair for any superclass, uh, sorry, for any subclass of uh, my environment class. Because I just use the same function, nothing changes. I'm just in a more restricted environment. So what I can do is, I can take the set of all environment classes for some fixed H, such that Hg is an Erdos Posa pair. What we can observe is that this set is uh, closed under the inclusion relation now. So I can do the following. For my fixed class H, I can define a notion of, a, of an abstraction with respect to the being an Erdos Posa pair. I can I define, I will define the, this frac C of H as the set that contains all environment classes that are minimal with the property of not being an endosposa pair. So this is somehow um, an, an abstraction notion of a second order level. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer talking about graphs, but I'm talking about sets of classes. So one small remark is that from the result of U, since we know that for any, any such pair where Z is uh, uh, one of my counterexample classes, this is a half integral Erdos Posa pair. If I were to prove such a duality result, I would like that I'm able to, in some way, certify the half integrality, even in, if I may fall into the case of a counterexample. And I will briefly explain very soon what I mean by certify the half integrality. OK, so let's do a small recap of what we have seen so far. So if I'm, in the K, if I'm in the world of excluding a planar graph, equivalently in the world of bounded tree width classes, then I know that I can prove my duality because of the interplay between a structural parameter tree width, its universal abstraction, which now I, it's no longer a grid. I do it as an annulus, but this is equivalent to the same thing. And we also know, with this new definition at hand, that the set of counterexamples is empty. There is, there, there is no counterexample. Every pair works if I, if, I re, if I exclude the planar graph in my guest class. And then we saw, we saw that uh, if I do not exclude the planar graph, then my counterexample classes contain at least these two surfaces, the orientable and non-orientable of minimal Euler genus such that at least one of my abstractions embed. And 
So for the specific case again for of k five minor free graphs, I um, we would like to have a more nice combinatorial way of seeing of understanding what it means to embed in these two minima surfaces in the same way that we have grids the parametric graph of grids for uh, planarity. So it actually there is a result by Claire Hiller and uh, Cyril Gavoil that extends this result to surfaces and it essentially gives us a construction of a, a grid-like graph that looks somehow like this where I take an annulus and I add this parallel transaction in the one of the two faces in order to um, in order to represent the handle of my surface and I add this crossing transaction in order to represent a cross cap of my surface and we know from Dijk's theorem that any surface is uh, isomorphic to a surface that starts uh, starting from the sphere and adding handles and cross caps. So this grid-like parametric graph on the left is uh, the combinatorial way to see the graphs embeddable in the, in the torus, the surface with one handle. This is what, uh, what I mean by sigma one zero there. I have one handle. And uh, this parametric graph on the right is uh, the combinatorial way to see uh, the graphs embeddable in the projective plane, the surface with one cross cap. So why, do, why am I interested in having this uh, nicer somehow uh, characterization of, of um, being embeddable in these surfaces? Is because in the same way that grids integrally pack themselves, which is very helpful for me <coughs> to prove my duality, these, these grid-like uh, parametric graphs no longer integrally pack themselves because they belong to counterexample classes, but they half integrally pack themselves. And the way to see it is somehow like this. I can, if my parametric graph is large enough, I take a large enough <coughs> instance, I, can, I contain as many half integral copies of itself now inside. So I somehow forget about the two surfaces and I just look at these parametric graphs and this gives me, at the same time, my counterexamples to, be, to the Erdosposa, to being an Erdosposa pair. At least these are two of the counterexamples, and uh, also give me a way to certify half integrality, which was what I wanted from the beginning. So, what do you mean by certifying half integrality? So, uh, what I mean is that in the same way that for planarity, if I, if I for some reason, if I have unbounded trig with I find a big grid in my graph, I can immediately find my edge barrier. Here, if I find in my input graph one of these two guys, like a big enough instance of it, I can immediately find the half integral edge barrier. I can, fi I can, I can find the half integral packing of an abstraction to my class. I, is there an easy argument to see why um, they are certificates of uh, half integrality? Uh, the, the, the reason is uh, that, as I said, that th this, this parametric graph, if I take a large enough instance of it, a large enough instance for this uh, type of uh, this annulus way of drawing it, means that I, each time my index increases, I contain more cycles, and I also increase the number of paths in my transaction inside. So the larger this is, I can half integrally pack itself inside many, many times. Of some integrally pack, uh, some instance of smaller order. And uh, what do I mean by half integrally? I find essentially copies of the same thing where only uh, uh, every vertex is used only in two copies. So I, I, I can no longer expect to be in integral, but I can, I can still expect to be half integral because of the result of u. OK, so <coughs> before I finally introduce try to talk about what it is that we're trying to do. I want to take a step back and uh, see this problem from a more order theoretic perspective. So somebody gives me my class H. So I define this set of uh, minimal counterexamples to the Erdos-Rosa pair property. But first of all, is this set even well defined? Does this set exist? And even if it exists, is it finite? Can we expect? To, for this to be finite for some instantiations of H. And uh, even if this is the case, can we find an explicit constructive upper bound to the, to the number of, of classes that are counterexamples? So 
So, actually, uh, an answer to the first question is uh, the answer to the first question is positive, and this immediately follows from the fact that minors are well quasi ordered by uh, the, the minor. Uh, yes, the graphs are well quasi ordered by the minor relation, and the reason is that this partial order being a well quasi order is equivalent to to saying that the, the set of minor closed classes, which I denote by this G all with a minor on top, heavy notations, ordered by the subset relation, this being well-founded, which essentially well-founded means that if I take any set of, uh, of minor closed classes, the minimal elements of this set exist. So this is the way I define this uh, set of classes. So existence of minimal elements give me the fact that these classes do in fact exist, these sets do in fact exist. But what about finiteness? Well, if we were to assume that I have a stronger condition, stronger assumption on uh, the partial order of minors, and namely this stronger assumption would be to assume that this is an omega squared well quasi, order as, uh, well quasi ordering as it is called. I will not give a definition of this. The only thing I will mention is that this is somehow a second order level well quasi order, is, a, is a something strictly stronger, strictly stronger assumption. Then it, this would immediately imply that this is always finite. And the reason is that I, 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 I go one level above in this assumption, and this is equivalent to going one level above also for the partial order of classes with respect to the subset relation. So if this were a omega squared will cause the ordering, then uh, the other one would be a well quasi ordering, and then this would mean that I have finite anti chains. So, as this, again, because of the minimality of the way I define these sets, this would mean that they are immediately finite. However, um, according to Robertson, Seymour, and Thomas, in some paper they published in Memoirs of the ACM in 96, and I quote, uh, talking about these kind of order theoretic conjectures, they said that uh, this would imply that the set of all graphs is second order, better quasi ordered, whatever this means, mm -hmm. by my containment, which is itself seems to be a hopelessly difficult problem. So we cannot expect to prove such, a, um, to obtain such a result. And even if somebody managed to prove such a thing, it would most likely be a non-constructive proof. As it is the as is the proof of well quasi orderedness, and there are reasons to to believe that there is no way to obtain a constructive proof. So, if we actually want to find such dualities, our only hope is to look for an explicit proof. Okay, so what is it that we prove um, in the end? So, we show that for every fixed class H, any given guest class H we give an explicit construction of a finite set of grid-like, again, parametric graphs, which I will denote by this WH half. And these parametric graphs have the property that they uh, combinatorially capture the, exactly the, the Erdos posa pair counterexample classes. So every counterexample class is the set of minors of one of these parametric graphs we define. And uh, the approach to proving this is essentially an extension of the standard approach, of the standard proof I gave you uh, of, of the, in the case of excluding a planar graph. So we uh, find an appropriate extension to tree width, which is sensitive to, which, yes, it's sensitive to the, to the class I give it. There is a different instantiation for each guest class H. And essentially, we prove a universal abstraction result for this parameter. We obtain a set of parametric graphs, that is the universal abstraction. And uh, so part of these parametric graphs are the half integral ones that give me my counterexamples, that, as I said. And then I also have this extra set W of H. We'll, we'll explain shortly what it is. So the approach is exactly the same as before. So if I'm in this. If I'm in the set setting that my input graph has bounded H3 width by some appropriate function, then I just uh, repeat my inductive proof in almost the same way. While if it is unbounded, but the abstraction I get is a large instance from the family on the right, then I can, in the same way as for the grids, I can immediately find a large 
H bar in there because these parametric graphs are not counter examples. They contain integral barriers. They integrally pack themselves. <coughs> so they also give me a certificate of integrality. And if I'm in the unfortunate case that <coughs> the obstruction I get, uh, I get is a and large instance of one of these half integral parametric graphs that correspond to my counter examples, I uh, can still obtain a large half integral H barrier because all of these parametric graphs half integrally pack themselves as the two examples that I showed before. So this gives me my certificate of half integrality. So the theorem we prove is that for any H, for any G, this is an Erdos-Posa pair if and only if for every i the, in R, R is the, the number of uh, these counterexamples that we find, uh, G does not contain the entire sequence for every i. Another way to see it, probably a more easy way to see it, is that G does not contain any of my counterexample classes as a subclass. Moreover, we actually have a constructive upper bound to the number of these uh, counterexample classes, which is the same as the number of these uh, half integral parametric graphs. And this is a single exponential some polynomial of the unique leakage function, where h of h is the maximum size of an abstraction of my class h. And as a corollary of all of these results, and uh, the, the reason why this works is because, as I said before, the, our abstraction of the parametric graphs that correspond to our abstractions half integrally pack themselves, so they give me a certificate of half integrality. We, can, we also prove a Thomas conjecture, lose the result, with an explicit upper bound, which is double exponential in K, with a lot of bad stuff hidden there in the polynomial with respect to H. And yes, so this is pretty much it. So, and uh, how much time do I have left? I guess I still have time. So I'm in the last few slides, I'm going to try to give you the definition of this extension of trigger that we use, and also explain very, very abstractly, very roughly, how we actually construct these uh, grid-like parametric graphs, our counterexamples. So what is this extension of trigger? So I take again uh, a 3D composition of my graph, but with the following small twist, I allow my leaf bugs to be as large as they want to be. And the only property I want is that, first of all, the adhesion set to the rest of the world is bounded. Uh, the intersection between this bug, essentially, and this parent bug is bounded. <laughs> Every other bug is of bounded size as before. But I also want the extra property that the graph induced by the leaf bug without the adhesion set belongs in H, does not contain any abstraction for my class. And this is the way I define what, I, what we call an H3 decomposition of uh, small width. And this uh, definition actually corresponds to a well-known definition, well-known, uh, a known definition of the literature that came up in the last few years, which is called H3 width. And when I made these slides, I put this uh, name of authors in, the <laughs> in my slide, but apparently I, I found out from Sebastian that actually this is not the paper that this parameter originated from, but is it in the end? I think it is. Ojan uh, says it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the authors says it's not, but uh, okay. Well, yeah, uh, at least probably this is the first place where it is explicitly defined. They give it an alternative definition, but this is an equivalent definition with respect to this uh, 3D composition. So what do we do? How do we use this parameter? So we do exactly the same thing as before. I am repeating myself. So if I'm given a graph G and with some appropriate function that comes out from our proofs, I am in the bounded setting, I can just I apply the same inductive proof as I showed you before, with the only small difference being that in the case I orient everything towards a leaf node, uh, the only thing I remove because of this property that my leaf bug has is the, is the adhesion set. And this has to be a modulator because no model can survive in my leaf bug. So I immediately conclude. So nothing really changes in the bounded setting. setting. And then the, the 
most difficult thing to prove, which is the spans the, the most number amount of pages in the, our draft that we're currently trying to write, is essentially uh, a general grid theorem, if you will, that gives us the obstructions to large H3 width for any in, for every instantiation of H3 width. So what we prove is that for fixed H, there exists some function depending on this class, such that if my H3 width is larger than this, fu this function, then there is a large instance of one of these grid-like parametric graphs that we have defined in, as a minor in my graph. And um, to make this a little more easily digestible, perhaps, I look again at K5 minor free graphs. So the complete picture for K5 minor free graphs is that the universal abstractions to the H3 width for this class is, uh, are the two grid-like parametric graphs that represent the two surfaces we saw before. So these are the only two counterexamples to the half integral, to the integrality, to, the, to being, yes, being an Erdos-Posa pair, an integral Erdos-Posa pair. And the only other abstraction is a uh, nanolus where I just paste a bunch of copies of K5 on one of the two faces inside or outside, it doesn't really matter. So this gives me my counterexamples, and this graph actually trivially contains a packing of K5 inside, so it gives me my integral barrier. And this is how we prove our duality. So if my class contains as a subclass one of my counterexamples, I immediately conclude in the same way as the, the, the surfaces, the counterexample that we saw before. And for the reverse direction, if my class does not contain any of these classes as a subclass, so it excludes one of these, one instance from each of these half integral parametric graphs, then I know that the only reason for H3 with being large is if I find one of these integ integral guys inside, where I f can find my integral H barrier and conclude in the same way as the original proof. So this uh, essentially completely delineates the half integrality of the Erdos-Posa property. We find uh, like a, a threshold of what, what is the reason essentially that we have to shift from being integral to being half integral. In, in, in the third picture, do you have something in the middle or is it empty? Uh, no, it's empty. These are just K5. Maybe I should have drawn this a little bit larger. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, these are just K5s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the last thing that I will try to explain is how do we construct these uh, counterexamples? So, um, just looking at surface embeddability is no longer enough. So this is somehow the extreme side of the picture. So we always know that two of our counterexamples will be uh, determined by surface embeddability. But there is a whole world in between of trying to understand what it means to somehow almost embed in a surface. And this is the missing, the, the, the key thing we have to, to observe. So what do I mean by almost embed? So I take again a torus. And I, uh, I, I embed my graph G in the torus. Sorry, I, I take my torus. And the first thing I do is I cut out some holes. I remove some disks from my surface. So I create this bunch of holes in my surface. So what I do then is I try to embed my graph G. And outside of these holes, I really want an embedding, as before. I, I do not allow edges to cross. But inside of these disks, I allow for an arbitrary behavior. I allow my, a completely non-planar thing to be drawn inside of there. So the, um, the way we construct our counterexamples is by Defining, f first of all, I, I, I'm looking for essentially a model of my abstraction in my graph G. But I don't, I'm not looking for an arbitrary model. I, I want some model with some, I, I have to choose it in a minimal way, it satisf satisfy some extra properties. And uh, the way we do this is essentially by considering a connected subgraph of my graph G that contains this, my abstraction as a minor. And I, se I select this as the minimal subgraph I can find. So by doing this, I can somehow see my model as a topological minor model. Essentially, I can see my model as a bunch of terminal vertices, which are these green uh, square thingies I have here. 
and uh, everything else is just uh, paths connecting these terminal vertices. So the, 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 the important part here the, is the, to look at the terminal vertices. So everything else is just a, uh, a subdivision vertex, just a vertex of degree two. So because of the minimality, the number of terminals have to be bounded. They are bounded by a quadratic function in the size of the graph. And then the next thing which actually needs some work to prove is that such a minimal model has a, somehow a finite behavior within these uh, disks that we cut out from the surface. And the uh, finite behavior is that using some linkage arguments, we can prove that uh, the, the number of vertices on this boundary have to be bounded, upper bounded by some function in, in the unique linkage function. So what this does, it is essentially allows me to finitize somehow the behavior of my model inside of these disks. I have a bounded size boundary and a bounded number of terminal vertices on the inside. So if I compress this, if I go and dissolve all degree two vertices, I just obtain something finite, something I can, I can work with. So considering such models that have this nice behavior, we can look at all possible ways to define an almost embedding of uh, such a model and finally construct such a grid-like thing where I put uh, transactions that represent my surface on the left and then in sequential order I put this uh, nice uh, rainbows around a bunch of uh, like a, a linkage where it increases with the size of the parametric graph as my index increases and then I put a bunch of copies of uh, the graphs that are drawn inside, the compressed graphs that are drawn inside of uh, all of my holes in, the, in my almost embedding of my model. And uh, so as my index grows, the, the number of, of uh, paths here increases, the number of cycle increases, and the number of copies inside also increases. So this is very vague uh, idea of, of how to define this uh, this uh, counterexample grid-like thing is. Yes. So, so I will conclude. I will not try to waste more of your time. <laughs> so um, what I want to conclude with is we had a previous result, which is like was uh, the first result in this series of work we're trying to do, which I Sebastian presented to you like a few months ago. And translated in, th so the focus of this paper was slightly different, but translated in this setting essentially says that if I look at some very w specific weird class, which are Kuratovsky connected solo vortex minors, as I call them. So if my abstractions are belong in this class, then my counterexamples are exactly the two minimal surfaces in the way I defined them uh, before. And uh, just for the sake of completeness, being Kuratovsky connected essentially means that I any small order separation, for any small order separation of my graph, one of the two sides can be drawn in a planar way. So there is only one bad side, one non-planar side somehow, and this allows us to control a lot its behavior in our embedding. And the other, uh, the being a shallow vortex minor essentially is uh, being a minor of such a parametric graph where I just have these very simple crosses on one of the two faces. So anyway, this is not that important, just for completeness. So my question is that, we believe that, that the reverse is probably not true. And at the same time, we have very small examples of graphs, such that if they violate either of the two conditions, counter examples start to appear, which are not surfaces. They, they, they belong into the, most, the more complicated constructions that I showed you before. So my question is, what is the necessary and sufficient condition such that the counter examples are exactly determined by uh, surface embeddability, and we don't have an um, understanding of this somehow. And uh, yes, I will leave you with that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Christian, so I have a basic question. Try yes. to understand your formulation in a different way. So are you saying if you take, you have HG, if you take a graph G from the environment Yes. Class, now, what you're saying is half integral integrality is saying you put on vertex set of G hyper edges which are models of a obstructions in H. Yes. And then the matching number is basically the barrier number. 
Yes, actually. And transversal number is the yeah yeah the yeah this uh, yeah yeah very good yes this is uh, this is true actually. So there is a way to formulate this entire problem in uh, just with hypergraphs, and with actually with uh, you can define parameters that also do exactly what you say in this setting and do all of that there. But there is a small uh, technicality if you try to do this. I I believe that. For hypergraphs, you only you can only look at connected mo connected models. You can only exclude connected stuff because a, a hyper edge is somehow something connected. If, uh, in in this setting, everything that I talked about here actually works only for connected graphs because I try to simplify the presentation. But there is a way to fix it and make it work uh, for uh, also non-connected obstructions. But uh, yes, if uh, if we're only looking at connected obstructions then uh, what you're saying is perfectly true. You can see it as a problem in hypergraphs. Is there some example going beyond minor closed families? It seems like this proof used a lot is hereditarily having small sub separator, right? Yes. Um, so I guess that the, the most obvious thing that somebody could try to do is to see if they can, they can generalize all of this to topological minors. But uh, this probably won't go through because even the base case, even just the characterization, the equivalent characterization that here is planarity for when I can have an uh, Erdos posa pair, there the characterization, I don't, th I don't, this is not a published result, right? This is just a personal communication thing. Yeah. thing. Anyway. There are indications there that even just the characterization of the base case is NP complete to even uh, describe. So, <laughs> at least it would, it's definitely non non trivial to try and find counterexamples in this sense for topological minors, which I guess is just one step, ex just a small extension. So, I, I don't know. I, yes. And also, we have not thought about such a thing, but we're very discouraged somehow by this fact. Yes, please. So, so you defined this notion of uh, H true width. Yes. And I was just curious um, if, if this might be like, is there a chance that this is like asymptotically equivalent to just allowing an arbitrary tree decomposition? Yes. But then say that the, the weight is the maximum size of a modulator of a bag. <coughs> is, it, is, is it the same thing? Or yes. It is. Yeah, okay. it's, actually, it's actually the same thing. You can, uh -huh. you can alternatively define this yeah, decomposition cool. as having unbounded size uh, bags. Yeah. But you have to have some bounded size modulator within the bag, yeah. uh, like a local modulator, such that it hits any model that enters. This bag, oh, this for the bag. torsos of the back, for the yes. yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Nice, you, nice. You, you can define such a thing. This is this is equivalent. I okay. don't think it's exactly equal. We try no, to maybe not, but yeah, but, yeah, it's, yeah, but yeah. is this asymptotically equivalent? I yes, it kind of looks like it should be. I was wondering yeah. if you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you, you can do this. This is an alternative way to define this decomposition, but this is somehow, somehow more in line to what has already been done for H three with so. It's also uh, somehow an easier, also easier definition to deal with. So mm -hmm. in the end, we uh, stuck with this yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. I, I have a silly question. So you have this. I, I didn't really think about this. Record yielding implies these classes of the yes. graphs. Classes of graphs will be well founded. Yes. Um, and then, um, like, I mean, if you take the new subgraph relation, for instance, do you have an easy count example or like <laughs> something that? Well, I mean, I mean there's not much you can do with the new subgraph relation, yeah, right? Yeah, and there should be a lot of count examples. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, there should be very easy ones, actually, but I'm not sure. I mean, so you're trying to find the counterexample to why it is, uh, if you look at sets why, of... Why CH always exists, right? So that's the... Uh, I mean, yeah. this, for, uh, for minors, this just follows from just uh, facts yeah. in uh, order to read the facts. So an easy example f for like why this should not exist or a, a case where 
we cannot define it for like induced subgraphs or something. I'm, I'm not sure how. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm not even sure we can. We can formulate such a, such a question, but uh, finding a counter example easily, I'm not sure. I don't know. So this would require finding somehow uh, like an infinite decreasing sequence of classes close to under mm -hmm. reduced subgraphs, which probably is not that difficult. Does this proof also give you some algorithm when you have a uh, yes. like certain input, either you find something or something? Yes, something? yes, yes. So the, all of these uh, results are constructive. So uh, an algorithmic consequence of all of this is that if you, we can we have an algorithm that says that you give me my input graph G, so it either gives me uh, a large half, so it either gives me a large instance of an abstraction, one of the integral ones, or a large instance of an abstraction of the half integral ones, or it gives me a small modulator. And in the case of the two uh, counter examples, I can then again apply the fact that these integrally or half integrally pack themselves to obtain a large H barrier or a large half integral H barrier. So we somehow have an answer to the to, to, to a, the half integral is finding like a large half integral barrier problem. So I either find a large half integral barrier given some graph G or I find a small modulator to my class. And the gap is this double exponential uh, function that I I talked about before. Is the running time like n to the or something? Or the running time is uh, <laughs> is like cubic. Uh, n to the four log n. Oh, it, it, it got worse now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> so yes, it's a uh, n to the four log n. <laughs> yeah. But uh, maybe something to comment is that mm -hmm. this algorithm maybe it's worse in uh, running time, but uh, it keeps the bound on the parameter somehow civilized. So it's like double exponential. We can we can do the exactly the same thing with the knowledge, just the combinatorial knowledge of mm -hmm. proving these uh, universal abstraction results. We could just apply like uh, we just do minor checking, like brute force minor checking, and get an algorithm, a quadratic algorithm, but the the, the dependency on k will be horrific, mm -hmm. not double exponential like here. So there is this uh, interplay somehow between uh, just applying the algorithm that comes out through our proofs or just brute forcing everything. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? So, so if not, let's thank the speaker.